Overcoming life's challenges is part of the shared human experience, but some individuals not only overcome what seem like insurmountable challenges, they turn those obstacles into a source of inspiration for all of us. This week, lessons on living life beyond limits. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. <laughs> Wes Moore is an American author, entrepreneur, military veteran, and television personality. His first book, The Other Wes Moore, was a New York Times bestseller and told the story of two men sharing the same name. They may have had the same name and lived in the same city, but that's where the similarities ended. One grew up to be a Rhodes Scholar, decorated combat veteran, White House fellow, and business leader. The other is a convicted murderer serving a life sentence in prison. Moore examines why, with so much in common, they ended up taking such different paths in life. Moore's latest book, The Work, profiles modern-day change makers who've transcended daunting obstacles to find their own purpose and created a better world. I sat down with Wes Moore in our Washington, D.C. studios to find out why he thinks a life lived in service to others is truly a life lived with impact. Uh, I'm not going to be as funny as some of the other hosts who've introduced you and given you a resume. Some have said you're, you're 68 years old, and others have said you're going to be president of the United States. So I'll leave those to others. I don't have any great uh, funny lines. I'll just dive in. Wes Moore, a Rhodes Scholar, an Army captain in Afghanistan, a White House fellow, an investment banker, a veterans advocate, a best-selling author, a television host, so to get bored easier is just that <laughs> finding that passion is it elusive? Completely frenetic, I know. Well, you know, and honestly, I think what it is was that, uh, you know, with, with everything that I was doing, there was this bigger quest of being able to understand, you know, kind of what is my role. I and mean, one thing I even tried to show within the stories was, uh, you know, I had a lot of mentors and supporters who would, who would give me advice, most of it completely out of love saying like, oh, you should really do X, or you should really do Y. And especially considering my background and my childhood, you know, I always had this sense that you were kind of on a sense of borrowed time, right? Where the things that I'd seen and, and the places that I'd gone, these are places my family could only dream of. And I took that seriously, this idea that, you know, I have, because of their sacrifices, I have a chance to do something really, you know, new for our family and, and unique. Uh, I want to take advantage of that. But I think as I was going through the process, you then start realizing that, you know, you can always take the advice of others. You can always take their ideas and, and, and share their insights and, and, you know, assume that that's going to bring you in a better direction because the advice they're giving you is from the bottom of their heart, genuine. Um, but at the end of each day, you are the one that needs to be satisfied with the path, with the path that you've taken because you are the only person who you have to be accountable to. You are the only person that you have to stand up there and say, today I did what I was supposed to be doing. And that was something that I think I needed to go through that process to kind of figure out in my own mind. Service is a word that just, I think is sprinkled throughout the book. Uh, it's important. Uh, it's important for the people that are served, but obviously for the person doing the serving. Can you talk about that? And, and why is there such a payoff, do you think, for people who are committed to service? Well, you know, I, I think service is so important because if you're not going to do it to be selfless, you should do it to be selfish, right? I, I just think, you know, for two reasons. One, I think it helps us to establish better communities. It helps us to establish better cities and better states and better nations and, and a better world. Uh, because if we have a world where everybody is engaged and everybody's involved, then that world's going to be safer. That world's going to be more prosperous. That world is going to be happier. If you have a jurisdiction or if you have an area or if you have a world where you have massive amounts of disillusionment, where you have massive amounts of inequity, where you have massive, massive amounts of, of, of hatred, you are going to live in a world that's amazingly unsafe uh, and, 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 and unhappy. That's not the kind of world that any of us want to live in. So on a macro level, I think it's important because it helps us to have a better world to live in. On the micro level, uh, it was actually interesting because I remember uh, I was, had a chance to speak with Harry Belafonte um, once and, you know, 
we were doing an interview with him and a lot of people around the table were asking him about you know his time in Radio City Music Hall and Carnegie Hall. Um, and when I got a chance to ask him a question, my question was, you know, a lot of celebrities intentionally will stay away from difficult issues because they're afraid it will hurt their bottom line or people won't like them because of a political stance that they take. They won't read their books, they won't see their movies, they won't listen to their songs, etc. But he made it a lifetime habit of getting involved in issues of the day. And I asked him, I said, why was that important to you? And he said something that I thought was fascinating. He said, because it's just more fun to live that way. He said, some people wake up in the morning and they call their accountants. I wake up in the morning and I call Nelson Mandela. Who do you think has a more interesting life? And so we also do it because it just helps us to live a more interesting life. You know, if we do have one shot at this, we want to spend our days doing things that are interesting. And I think that becomes a life well lived. It's interesting, uh, the, the Mandela story, that's Belafonte, that's just fantastic. But I think when people say, you know, you should dedicate your life to service, what a lot of people hear is, oh my God, there's no money in this. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people want to chase the cash. I mean, there's a great song by Jackson Brown, The Pretender, where he says, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a happy idiot. I'm going to struggle for the legal tender. Yeah. And in a sense, you write about that. Yeah. Um, you went in search of cash oh, and yeah. met with one of your mentors who didn't respond the way you <laughs> thought he was. Tell, share that story. Not at all. He, uh, I, uh, I went to go see him and I told him, he asked what I was going to be doing. I just come back from Afghanistan and was working in Washington. And uh, he said, what do you want to do next? And I told him, I think I'm going to go off to go off to Wall Street. And his response was, really? You know, and I told him, I said, that's not quite the response I thought you were going to give me. Uh, and he said, why? And I explained to him why. I said, you know, you know, I, I felt like it's a skill set I wanted to learn. I felt like, you know, I, I, I felt it was an experience I wanted to have. I was still at that point taking care of many members of my family. So I needed to make some money. And he, met, he said to me, he said, listen, you know, he said, all those answers sound great. The one thing that you never said to me in that whole answer that you gave me was that it's because you're passionate about it. And he said, listen, I, I'm never going to judge you on decisions that you make for your family. However, the only thing I ask is this, is the moment that you feel like you have done what you need to do, leave. Because every day you spend doing something that you are not passionate about, you become extraordinarily ordinary. And that piece of advice never left me. Because he's right. You know, when you think about all the people in this, on this planet who are really great at what they do. I mean, really, really great at what they do. There's only one thing all of them have in common. It's not what country they're from. It's not who their parents were. It's not where they went to school. The one thing that all of them have in common is that they are unbelievably passionate about what they do. I've never met someone who's great at what they do, really great, and asked them, do you like what you do? And have them say, it's okay. I've never heard that, and I don't think I ever will. And I, so I think his advice was really appropriate to me, where that, you know, like, our goal should be to be great. Because if you're great, you'll not just be recognized, you'll be compensated. And that is where your joy will come from, in the fact that you're doing something you're unbelievably passionate about, and you know your happiness with every single day walks alongside of you. If you chase a job simply because you feel like it's going to pay you the most amount of money, and you don't like it, which probably means you're not very good at it, you'll find yourself not just alone, a but, uh, but, but, but the money won't be following you anywhere either. Well, it's like the old saying, follow your passion and the money will follow. But a lot of people don't believe that. I, yeah. People think it's either or. But, it's, but you found the case. I mean, obviously, you're passionate about what you do. Uh, you're not destitute. I mean, you got these yeah. great looking socks. Thank uh, you. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I guess you're kind of a living testimony that, that it isn't either. Or. Well, you know, it's funny because I mean, I had I had mentors who would tell me that. And they're like, you know, if you just <laughs> if you follow what you love, money will follow. I'm like, yeah, you're rich. It's easy for you to right, say right. that. You know, I, I didn't come from money. So therefore, I'm going to go to the occupations that I think are going to pay me the most amount of money. But I realized more and more as I got older, I was like, you know what? But they're right that they're right about this idea that, you know, if, but if you, you continue simply to follow a path that you think is the right path because it's quote unquote lucrative, then you're going to have a very difficult time managing and balancing. You know, there's a, there's a great song by a, by a hip hop artist called Lauryn Hill. 
uh, hip hop R&B artist, and she has this song. She had an album called The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. And the title track of that song was great because it said, um, there's a line in it where she says, and every time I try to be what someone else thought of me. And every time I've tried to be what someone else thought of me, so caught up I was unable to achieve. But deep in my heart, the answer, it wasn't me. And I made up my mind to define my own destiny. And I think, you know, and every time I hear that song, it gives me chills because I'm like, she's so spot on. Because the people who are who are, who will manage to find their own joy and happiness and also, you know, their own sense of monetary value is the ones who have defined their own destiny and they're really great at what they do. If you are the best at what you do, you'll be compensated for it, no matter what that best happens to be. And if you're middle of the pack or worse at what you do, I could care less what your occupation is. The compensation will not follow along with you because you're not proving that value. What we need to do is focus on being great. What we need to do is focus on proving our value. Once you've done that, then the other things have a way of working themselves out. What do you think it is in these change makers? Is, is there a common thread? I mean, is it, is, is it ambition? Is it inspiration? I mean, what, what's the guiding principle? Is there some, is there some connective t tissue there? There's a few articles of, of collective tissue that exist in all of them. I think one of them, one of them is that they all understand the service is not like a, it, it's not a one size fits all equation. That, you know, it's not like, well, everyone's gonna mobilize and fix X because if you're not passionate about X, um, the one thing we know is that when hard days come, hard days will become last days. So I think they are genuinely passionate about what they do, whether it be, you know, one thing we try to do even with the stories, and I tell people, you know, we're not trying to tell you what to think. I just simply want to ask you to think, right? Think about what is that thing that makes you come alive and then go do it. So whether it's the environment or whether it's health care or whether it's military issues or whether it's race issues or whatever it is, find that thing and then go do it. I think another thing that, uh, another piece of connective tissue that exists amongst all these change makers is they're very clear that the people who they're trying to serve and the people who they're trying to help they make, it, they make it an effort to make sure the people that they're trying to support are part of the conversation and not just subjects of the conversation. There's this idea that people realize that in order to lead them, that you must love them. And I think when you're watching real change agents do their work, this is not something where they're preaching about a certain issue, uh, but it really what they're doing is they're having a, an involved conversation about a certain issue and then being able to move all the pieces in the right place in order to make real impact on that issue. What about asking questions of yourself? You, you talk about that and I don't want to give all the questions away because yeah. then we don't sell enough of your books. Exactly. But, uh, <laughs> but what, if someone were to come to you at, at a dinner party and say, what questions should I be asking myself? What, what might you tell them? If you were to pick two or three, what would they be? I, I'd say one of the questions, uh, you know, I, I, I have a, a friend who has a, has a test uh, that he takes, which I think is really kind of unique. He calls it the shower test. And what the shower test is, he's like, do you think about what you do in the shower? He said, if the answer is yes, then you're doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And if the answer is no, you're not. And I thought that was really interesting when, uh, when, you know, when, when I first heard this examination of what that meant was, you know, I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, do I, the work that I do every day, when I'm in the shower, is this something, and when I answered the answer yes, I went back, I was like, you know what, I'm doing the work I'm supposed to be doing. So is it something that you can never get rid of? Is it something that during random moments of the day, ideas will start fluttering about what can I do better tomorrow? What kind of adjustments can I make? That's something I think you have to think about in terms of is it the work that you're supposed to be doing. I think the other thing that you want to think about is, is, um, is it something that is going to make a market impact on the world long after you're no longer even part of the world? You know, I had a colonel when I was in uh, military school. I got sent away to military school when I was 
when I was younger for some issues that I got into. And, uh, but during my time in, in military school, I, uh, I had, we had this colonel there, and he's a three-time Vietnam veteran. This guy was as tough as nails. And, but he was losing weight really quickly. And he called the Corps cadets together and told us that he was diagnosed with cancer, and he had to leave the school. But in what turned out to be his farewell address, he said something that I thought was fascinating, and I'll never forget it. He said, when it's time for you to leave here, whether it be time for you to leave this school, whether it's time for you to leave your job, whether it's time for you to leave your neighborhood, or when it's time for you to leave this planet, make sure that it mattered that you were ever even here. And I think another question that I think we also always have to ask ourselves is by what we're doing now, will it matter that we were ever even here? And if the answer is yes, then you're doing your work. If the answer is no, if the answer is the moment I get up from this seat, someone will be right back in it before the seat even gets hot, and before the seat even gets cold, um, then are we really doing our work? And that's what I hope people would ask as well. Uh, the other West Moore, uh, enormously successful. Uh, for our viewers who may not be familiar with the book, walk us through, give us a synopsis. So the, um, the, the day after I, see, I received the Rhodes Scholarship, the Baltimore Sun, which is my hometown paper, wrote this article about this local kid who, uh, despite having uh, you know, not the easiest of, of childhoods, um, just received this award. And I was getting ready to head off to England on this scholarship. And the same time, the Baltimore Sun was also writing a whole series of articles about these four guys who walked into a jewelry store and, uh, and killed an off-duty police officer in a botched robbery. Um, and of the four guys that the police were looking for that was eventually captured and tried and convicted and sentenced for the crime, one of the people that the police caught was this guy whose name was also Wes Moore. And the more I learned about this crime and this tragedy, the more I realized how much more Wes and I had in common than just our names. And as I was getting ready to head off to England on the scholarship, he was getting ready to spend the rest of his life in a maximum security facility in Maryland. And one day I just decided to write him a note. And a month later I got a letter back from Jessup Correctional Institution from Westmore. And that one letter turned to dozens of letters, those dozens of letters turned to dozens of visits. And now I've known West for, for over a decade. And the story of the other Westmore is really just the evolution of the lives of these two kids starting off when they were two and three years old, and then telling the story of what eventually happens that causes this split amongst them, that years later, when the Baltimore Sun is writing these articles, they're writing about one going to grad school and one going to a maximum security facility. And one Wes went this way, another went this way. Were there key decisions along the way that this Wes took and the other Wes took that is there a chance that Wes could have ever kind of diverted back into the same lane you were in? Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear that I, I honestly think that Wes probably has more innate potential than I ever did. I mean, this is a guy, and, and again, I'm in no way condoning his actions, but this is a guy when he was 14 and 15 years old was running a pretty complex drug operation over in, in, in East Baltimore. And, and I mean, think about it. And again, you're, you're not justifying the action by any stretch, but this is an industry that does not have, you know, the patience for getting numbers wrong, nor has the toleration for evidence, right? So when you're doing all this stuff, you're doing really all of it in your head. It's not like you're walking around with a calculator and a piece of, and a piece of paper because if a cop grabs you, you want your pockets to be empty. So he's doing all these calculations in his head, and he's not, he doesn't have the ability to say, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a zero. Like, this is a pretty unforgiving industry for that kind of stuff. And I just think of myself, and I often think about, what could have happened if we had figured out a way of changing the product? What could have happened had we taken that innate potential and actually done something useful with it? Uh, you know, Wes is in a six by eight cell right now because of decisions that he made, and he understands that. At the same time, I think part of my goal, I know now part of his goal, is to make sure that all young people as they're coming up they understand that there are consequences for the decisions that they make. And also on a societal level, that we understand there are consequences for our apathy. That we have to be able to get more involved and engaged, uh, lest we have more and more situations where you have a, a police officer and a father of five, who someone now has to make a phone call to his widow that none of us would ever want to have to make nor receive. That someone has to explain to his five kids why their father's not coming home.
that someone has to understand and help it, help his parents understand and his siblings why their brother or why their son died in the line of duty. These aren't conversations that we should be having. These aren't conversations that we should be having. Uh, and I think it behooves us as a larger society to get involved and engage so we don't have to continue having these conversations. I've heard you say that uh, you were, I think, four when you saw your dad die. You said you were 11 when you had, first time you had handcuffs on. I mean, there, were, there, there had to have been moments along the way where this West and that West, there were parallels. Were there defining moments where you, what do you see as the defining moments where you went this way and he went that way, do you think? Or is it too complex? I mean, are there too many of those defining moments? Well, you know, I, I think that life, life, is, uh, life is an interesting collection of, of, of defining moments. You know, I, the biggest question whether or not we recognize it and realize them as such. Um, there definitely was not kind of like, a, like an aha moment where everything made sense in my life. Uh, because I still think I'm learning still every day. And, I'm, uh, and I acknowledge that. Um, I think something that did start to happen though in my life that started to make a big impact was when I actually started thinking bigger about my own life. Because I think one of the, my biggest challenges was if you asked me when I was coming up, you know, so Wes, where do you see yourself in five or 10 or 15 years? Um, I didn't give you an answer. Because I just thought that there was no use in thinking long term because thinking, I always thought thinking long term about things wasn't a very good use of time. Because we're not guaranteed it. Um, but I then think eventually I started realizing and understanding that those who don't have some type of vision or goal for their future, life has a really nasty and cynical sense of humor for you. Uh, you have to have some, and I'm not saying you need to be like certain when I'm in 15 years I'll do X and in 25 years I'll do Y. Um, I think that's scary. But having some form of vision of where you want to go is important. Because if you don't have an idea of where you want to get to at some point, then, then good luck getting there. Wes, thanks so much. It's my honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up next, overcoming physical challenges to take the extreme to a new and painfully impressive level.